Project Guru. 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 Всем привет! С вами Зак Новак на радиостанции Новорусия Rocks. Welcome to Novorossiya Rocks radio station. This is Zach Novak, your American in downtown Donetsk. Project Guru program. Guru's in the house. Guru, thank you so much for all the hard work that you do. Andre, my engineer, is here as well. Ready, let's go. Another attack, another deliberate assault on innocent civilians. Bombs, shelling of civilian areas, trying to strike fear among the masses, trying to ethnically cleanse the Donbass region by the genocidal warmongering by the coup leader Poroshenko of the Ukraine Nazi regime. With the green light given by the Obama administration, especially Victoria Nuland, Joe Biden, to target the civilian in order to wipe out the population and try to rid the proud Russian-speaking people of their new republic, Donetsk. Two civilians were wounded as Ukrainian Nazi troops shelled the settlement of Zaitsevo, north of Gorlovka. Edward Basudin, spokesman for the Defense Ministry of the Donetsk People's Republic, said on Sunday. At 12.05 local time, Ukrainian Nazi troops opened fire, presumably from a grenade launcher. Two civilians, a woman 57 years old and a 15-year-old, her granddaughter, were wounded. Also, Justin, the intention targeting of civilians. The Nazi Kiev troops opened fire on the outskirts of Donetsk in the Donbass region overnight. Late evening, the Ukraine junta forces shelled the territory of Donetsk airport and Jabunki village to the north of Donetsk and Volvo center again. Ukrainian junta forces opened fire from the positions of Pesky and Opatnoya village using mortars with the calibers of 82, also with infantry uh, fighting vehicles, grenade launchers and small arms. Again, attacking civilians. This is war crimes. Assad forces overrun the last U.S.-backed moderate terrorist stronghold in Latakia. Pro-Assad government forces overran the last major moderate U.S.-backed terrorist held town in Syria's coastal Latakia province on Sunday as the United Nations prepared to host talks this week on ending the country's nearly five-year war. Syria's armed forces, the SAA, in coordination with the Popular Defense Militia, seized control of the town of Rabia. It is the second strategic victory for pro-Assad forces in Latakia in less than two weeks after government troops seized the so-called moderate fighters who are actually FSA ISIS bastion town of Salma on January 12th. Rabia had been held by the opposition FSA ISIS since 2012 and was controlled by a range of rebel terrorist groups including some made up of Syrian Turkmen as well as Al-Qaeda affiliate of Al-Nusra Front. Syrian state news agency Sana said government forces were combing the area to dismantle any explosive devices or mines planted by the terrorists, many of whom were killed. According to Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, Rabia fell on Sunday after a steady Syrian army advance that left the town surrounded. In the past 48 hours, Syrian armed forces surrounded the town from three sides, the south, west, and the north, by capturing 20 villages, observatory head Rami Abdel Rahman said. Abdel Rahman said senior Russian military officials oversaw the battle for Rabia and that Russian airstrikes played an essential role in the fight. With the capture of Rabia, government troops are closing in on terrorist rebel supply routes through the Turkish junta border to the north. Armed FSA ISIS opposition factions have used northern parts of Latakia province to carry out rocket and bomb attacks on the provincial capital along the coast. Backed by Russian air power, pro-Assad forces are chipping away at the territory in a bid to secure the proud people of Syria's Assad heartland. Guru, news over the weekend, Calais under attack, uncontrolled migration invasion, like a scene from a zombie movie, a series of photos and videos posted to Facebook by the residents of Calais, France, over the last 24 hours depicts a town under siege. Parents have been advised to keep their children indoors as migrants roam through playgrounds while on residential streets, police wearing ride gear stalk gangs of migrants. The pictures have been posted to Calais Libre, uh, Free Calais, a French language Facebook page set up and run by concern residents of Calais. The founders of the page say they set it up because they want to see Calais liberated from the grip of an uncontrolled migration invasion. They encourage residents to send in photos and videos, most most of which are shot on mobile phones, to document what is happening in Calais, including the migrants recently burning their camp to the ground. 
Many of the photos focus on the clash between migrants and police on the roads heading towards the port, but increasingly images are emerging of migrants within the town itself. Some are decidedly eerie, almost reminiscent of a scene from a zombie film. These were taken near the town's historic fort on the coast. In the last day, images have also begun to emerge depicting the migrants using public transport or loitering in bus and train terminals. According to the comments, they are using the transport to travel between Calais and nearby Dunkirk, where an alternative camp is growing thanks to a reduced police presence in the area. Locals are complaining that the migrants are not charged for using the public transport, yet take seats without giving them up for the elderly. Calais Libre have planned to hold gathering in Calais at the end of January to protest against the threat to safety that the migrants pose to the town and the slowdown in the local economy brought about by their presence. Also to protest against the actions of the No Borders movement in inciting the migrants to camp and riot in the area. The group has made it clear that the gathering is not a rally. However, as they say, rallies are currently prohibited by law. But if you check out the site at Novorussia today, also this came in, uh, the refugees there at Calais, they stormed Calais port in France. Uh, and board on a British ferry on Saturday. According to local officials, around 200 migrants managed to break into the port of Calais in northern France after a demonstration of support for migrants leaving in a slum nearby. A demonstration in Calais has drawn around 2,000 people, and in the end, around 200 people entered the port with approximately 50 of them boarding a ferry. Sports news, Serbia's domination in sports continues. A world record crowd of 18,000 fans saw a host Serbia win their third third successive European Water Polo Championship with a 10-8 win over neighbors Montenegro on Saturday. The attendance beat the competition record of allowed 11,000 for Serbia's opening 13-6 win over Croatia, the Ustasi Croatia. With the comeback arena capacity expanded for the clash between the traditional Balkan rivals. According to the organizers, more than 18 thousand watched the final of the 32nd European Championship, which is a new world record attendance in aquatics in the modern era. Water polo reached an unprecedented heights as all available seats in the venue were occupied and fans even stood on the terraces after the setup had been transformed. Serbia, who were also the world champions, overcame a one-goal deficit in a strong final quarter to delight a fervent home crowd after an entertaining tussle. Having earlier booked a place at the 2016 Olympics in Rio, Serbia were joined by Montenegro, who beat a more fancied Hungary and Italy teams to reach the final. Bravo, Serbia. Dima, this is for you. A uh, special guest just walked in. Dima, producer of uh, Novorussi uh, Documentary Films. You can see all his great films together with uh, Guru on working on great projects. Also, please, also, please get ready. The Che Guevara mini film will be released in a few days. Listen to this. Russia to honor the American Indians planning a memorial in front of U.S. Embassy in Moscow, a memorial dedicated to the genocide of the American Indians right next to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Russia to construct American Indian Genocide Memorial right in the front of the embassy. The initiative to install the monument uh, is very timely as an act that will remind people from where the history of the USA started, stated member of the Civic Chamber, Valery Koruvin, who supported the proposal. This monument must become the silent reproach to the modern American elites, which had significantly deviated from the idealistic principles that were laid into the foundation of the American state. According to Mr. Koruvin, the Civic Chamber of the Russian Federation should also appeal to the U.S. Congress to consider the rehabilitation of the American Indians as the native people of the United States to admit the fact of their genocide by the U.S. government to carry out the act of national repentance and thus to close this dark chapter of U.S. history as a state that carried out the highly moral act of recognition of the infringements on the rights of the people during the Great Patriotic War, the Russian name for World War II, and that rehabilitated the Chechnyans, Ingush, Crimean Tatars, and other peoples of the former USSR that were sent into exile. Russia has the right to call on the United States to repentance. Without repentance by the American society, it is not possible to talk about the leadership by the USA, and the USA have no moral ground to speak about rights and freedoms of this or other nations. Last week, it was made known that the Civic Chamber of Russian Federation, a Russian analog to the U.S. House Committee on Oversight, which has consultative powers, is planning to put forward a proposal for the installation of a memorial by the site of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, 
dedicated to the genocide of the American Indians. The request for permission to install such a monument was sent to the administration of Russian President Vladimir Putin to the Civic Chamber of the Russian Federation and to the Moscow City Authorities. The idea of reminding the U.S. or her former sins is not new within Russian political class. Crimes against humanity don't fall under the statute of limitations, said Gay Narishkin, Speaker of the Russian Parliament, brought the idea of putting the U.S. to international criminal court for atomic bombings of Japanese cities. Just last summer, for example, during the round table devoted to the 70th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the U.S., the Speaker of the Russian Parliament and head of the Russian Historical Society, Sergei Narishkin, raised the possibility of creating a special international criminal tribunal on bombing of the two Japanese cities. According to Mr. Uh, Mr. Narishkin and a number of other Russian politicians, these bombings clearly constituted crimes against humanity that don't fall under the statute of limitations. The modern-day U.S. administration wants to hide from the world, not the tragedy of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this is not possible to do, but the hypocrisy and cynicism of the American leaders of the time, Mr. Naryshkin said during the round table. He added that the memory about this crime is as important as the memory of the atrocities committed by both the Nazis and the Japanese militarists. Behind all the death and destruction, the CIA and Saudi covert program. While it's no secret that the CIA has had a covert program supplying weapons to Syrian rebels for years, and it's likewise no secret that Saudi Arabia has been throwing large sums of money and arms at rebel factions, it's only now being understood how closely linked those two schemes were. The administration is said to have seen the plan as a way to get control over Saudi arms smuggling into Syria, fearing that Saudis would be willing to send arms to factions the U.S would see as allies. This largely didn't work, of course, meaning the U.S. Saudi arms ended up more or less everywhere. The Saudis, meanwhile, saw letting the U.S. in on their arms scheme as both a rubber stamp for continuing the program and as a way to oblige the U.S. to let them be involved in the final settlement talks on the Syrian war and back Sunni Islamist factions. The tow anti-tank missiles and Chinese anti-craft missiles that ended up in the control of various rebel factions, including ISIS and other Islamists were provided by and large through the CIA program and sourced and paid for by the Saudis. Again, war of words between Erdogan, Nazi junta, president of Turkey, against our Naum Chomsky. Uh, but before I begin, uh, Diva, we discussed how the uh, United States and Turkey together of course, Turkey, NATO nation, together have signed a pact. They're going to go in together into Syria to make complications on Russia. We'll talk about that a little later. But this first, U.S. ally Erdogan, a murderer, viciously killing Kurds. Renowned intellectual Naum Chomsky said Turkey and the U.S. could not protect the Kurds and the Yazidis while attacking Kurdish guerrilla groups in Syria. Turkish President Erdogan is a murderer and has reconstituted horrendous repressive policies against the Kurdish population in Turkey that were implemented during the 1990s by the Turkish state, killing thousands of people, world-leading intellectual Noam Chomsky said during an interview. He, Erdogan, is undoubtedly carrying out a vicious repressive action attacking the Kurdish population. You can call it what you like. I call it murder. When asked about how to respond to the threat of Islamic State group, Chomsky said that the Kurdish forces in Turkey and Syria should be supported, who also happen to be on Washington's terrorism list. The United States could not be trying to save the Yazidis and the Kurds while also supporting Turkish oppression against the Kurdish Workers' Party, the PKK, who have been the main force, the main force fighting ISIS. If we are interested in attacking ISIS and saving the Yazidis and saving the Kurds, we cannot say we are going to attack them, the leading academic and linguist said. He also rejected the term lesser of two evils when evoked by the interviewer referring to the PKK. If you want to rank evils, the United States and Britain are so far higher than anybody else. We have to deal with the world as it is, as, as it exists. If you want to defend the Kurds, you cannot be attacking the Kurds. While acknowledging the PKK had in fact carried out attacks against civilians in the past, Chomsky said a realistic look at the world requires providing support to the PKK and other Kurdish groups who are the main forces against the extremist groups in Syria. I am not an absolute pacifist. I think there are times when the use of military forces defensively is legit. Defending the Kurds against ISIL attacks 
is legit, Chomsky said, using the acronym for the Islamic State group. But the renowned professor said the Islamic State group was not the only threat to the Kurds and the Syrian people. He said that the U.S. was turning a blind eye to the other extremist groups like Al-Qaeda, affiliate the Al-Nusra Front, who are being supported by Washington's allies, Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Commenting on the five-year Syrian conflict and how to resolve it, Chomsky said the only solution to the crisis in Syria is not through bombing Damascus, but through negotiations with the Syrian government. Support the PKK. Viva Oshalan. Everybody, please be safe. I stress, please be safe. See you all on Wednesday. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye, folks.